Chapter twenty four of Abraham Lincoln A History, Volume five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln A History, Volume five by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Harrison's Landing general mcclellan was greatly agitated by the battle of gaines's mill and by the emotions incident to his forced departure for the james under the influence of this feeling he sent to the secretary of war from savage's station on the twenty eighth of june an extraordinary dispatch which we here insert in full as it seems necessary to the comprehension of his attitude towards and his relations with the government i now know the full history of the day on this side of the river the right bank we repulsed several strong attacks on the left bank our men did all that men could do all that soldiers could accomplish but they were overwhelmed by vastly superior numbers even after i brought my last reserves into action the loss on both sides is terrible i believe it will prove to be the most desperate battle of the war the sad remnants of my men behave as men those battalions who fought most bravely and suffered most are still in the best order my regulars were superb and i count upon what are left to turn another battle in company with their gallant comrades of the volunteers had i twenty thousand or even ten thousand fresh troops to use to-morrow i could take richmond but i have not a man in reserve and shall be glad to cover my retreat and save the material and personnel of the army if we have lost the day we have yet preserved our honor and no one need blush for the army of the potomac i have lost this battle because my force was too small i again repeat that i am not responsible for this and i say it with the earnestness of a general who feels in his heart the loss of every brave man who has been needlessly sacrificed to-day i still hope to retrieve our fortunes but to do this the government must view the matter in the same earnest light that i do you must send me very large reinforcements and send them at once i shall draw back to this side of chickahominy and think i can withdraw all our material please understand that in this battle we have lost nothing but men and those the best we have in addition to what i have already said i only wish to say to the president that i think he is wrong in regarding me as ungenerous when i said that my force was too weak i merely intimated a truth which to-day has been too plainly proved if at this instant i could dispose of ten thousand fresh men i could gain a victory to-morrow i know that a few thousand more men would have changed this battle from a defeat to a victory as it is the government must not and cannot hold me responsible for the result i feel too earnestly to-night i have seen too many dead and wounded comrades to feel otherwise than that the government has not sustained this army if you do not do so now the game is lost if i save this army now i tell you plainly that i owe no thanks to you or to any other persons in washington you have done your best to sacrifice this army it is probable that no other general would have retained his commission for twenty-four hours after the receipt of such a communication by his superiors but it is easy to see the reason why he was never called to account for it the evident panic and mental perturbation which pierced through its incoherence filled the president with such dismay that its mutinous insolence was entirely overlooked he could only wonder what terrible catastrophe already accomplished or to come could have wrung such an outcry as this from the general commanding even the surrender of the army was not an impossible disaster to expect from a general capable of writing such a dispatch secretary chase has left a memorandum showing that some such action was regarded as indicated by general mcclellan's telegrams and that even after his arrival at harrison's landing general marcy his father-in-law and chief of staff in a visit to washington spoke of it as a possibility 
not knowing the extent of the mischance which had fallen upon the army the president hastened at once to send a kind and encouraging answer to mcclellan's dispatches save your army at all events we'll send reinforcements as fast as we can of course they cannot reach you to-day to-morrow or next day i have not said you were ungenerous for saying you needed reinforcements i thought you were ungenerous in assuming that i did not send them as fast as i could i feel any misfortune to you and your army quite as keenly as you feel it yourself if you have had a drawn battle or a repulse it is the price we pay for the enemy not being in washington we protected washington and the enemy concentrated on you had we stripped washington he would have been upon us before the troops could have gotten to you less than a week ago you notified us that reinforcements were leaving richmond to come in front of us it is the nature of the case and neither you nor the government are to blame please tell at once the present condition and aspect of things the president also with the greatest diligence sent dispatches on the same day to general dix at fort monroe to admiral goldsborough commanding the naval forces in the james and to general burnside in north carolina directing all three of them to strain every nerve in order to go to mcclellan's assistance at the same time he ordered halleck to send a large portion of his forces to the rescue as the twenty ninth and thirtieth of june passed without news of any further catastrophe the president and the secretary of war began to think better of the situation and concluded that it might possibly be improved by a change of base to the james mr stanton telegraphed to general wool that it looked more like taking richmond than at any time before but on the first of july a dispatch dated at turkey bridge arrived from general mcclellan who was still under the influence of great agitation announcing that he is hard pressed by superior numbers and fearing that he shall be forced to abandon his material and save his men under cover of the gunboats if none of us escape we shall at least have done honor to the country i shall do my best to save the army send more gunboats while waiting for his troops to come to the new position he had chosen for them he continued asking for reinforcements i need he says fifty thousand more men and with them i will retrieve our fortunes the secretary of war at once answered that reinforcements were on the way five thousand from mcdowell and twenty five thousand from halleck hold your ground he says encouragingly and you will be in richmond before the month is over on the morning of the battle of malvern mcclellan writes again i dread the result if we are attacked to-day by fresh troops i now pray for time it has been seen that his dread was uncalled for meanwhile before hearing of the battle the president had telegraphed it is impossible to reinforce you for your present emergency if we had a million of men we could not get them to you in time we have not the men to send if you are not strong enough to face the enemy you must find a place of security and wait rest and repair maintain your ground if you can but save the army at all events even if you fall back to fort monroe we still have strength enough in the country and will bring it out on the second the flurry of the week having somewhat subsided the president sent him the following your dispatch of tuesday morning induces me to hope your army is having some rest in this hope allow me to reason with you a moment when you ask for fifty thousand men to be promptly sent you you surely labor under some gross mistake of fact recently you sent papers showing your disposal of forces made last spring for the defense of washington and advising a return to that plan i find it included in and about washington seventy five thousand men now please be assured i have not men enough to fill that very plan by fifteen thousand all of fremont's in the valley all of banks all of mcdowell's not with you and all in washington taken together do not exceed if they reach sixty thousand with wool and dix added to those mentioned i have not outside of your army seventy five thousand men east of the mountains 
thus the idea of sending you fifty thousand or any other considerable force promptly is simply absurd if in your frequent mention of responsibility you have the impression that i blame you for not doing more than you can please be relieved of such impression i only beg that in like manner you will not ask impossibilities of me if you think you are not strong enough to take richmond just now i do not ask you to try just now save the army material and personnel and i will strengthen it for the offensive again as fast as i can the governors of eighteen states offer me a new levy of three hundred thousand which i accept this quiet and reasonable statement produced no effect upon the general on the third he wrote again in a strain of wilder exaggeration than ever he says it is of course impossible to estimate as yet our losses but i doubt whether there are to-day more than fifty thousand men with their colours to accomplish the great task of capturing richmond and putting an end to this rebellion reinforcement should be sent to me rather much over than much less than one hundred thousand men i beg that you will be fully impressed by the magnitude of the crisis in which we are placed the didactic not to say magisterial tone of this dispatch formed a not unnatural introduction to the general's next important communication to the president laying before him an entire body of administrative and political doctrine in which alone he intimated the salvation of the country could be found headquarters army of the potomac camp near harrison's landing virginia july seventh eighteen sixty two mr president you have been fully informed that the rebel army is in our front with the purpose of overwhelming us by attacking our positions or reducing us by blocking our river communications i cannot but regard our condition as critical and i earnestly desire in view of possible contingencies to lay before your excellency for your private consideration my general views concerning the existing state of the rebellion although they do not strictly relate to the situation of this army or strictly come within the scope of my official duties these views amount to convictions and are deeply impressed upon my mind and heart our cause must never be abandoned it is the cause of free institutions and self-government the constitution and the union must be preserved whatever may be the cost in time treasure and blood if secession is successful other dissolutions are clearly to be seen in the future let neither military disaster political faction nor foreign war shake your settled purpose to enforce the equal operation of the laws of the united states upon the people of every state the time has come when the government must determine upon a civil and military policy covering the whole ground of our national trouble the responsibility of determining declaring and supporting such civil and military policy and of directing the whole course of national affairs in regard to the rebellion must now be assumed and exercised by you or our cause will be lost the constitution gives you power sufficient even for the present terrible exigency this rebellion has assumed the character of a war as such it should be regarded and it should be conducted upon the highest principles known to christian civilization it should not be a war looking to the subjugation of the people of any state in any event it should not be at all a war upon population but against armed forces and political organizations neither confiscation of property political executions of persons territorial organization of states or forcible abolition of slavery should be contemplated for a moment in prosecuting the war all private property and unarmed persons should be strictly protected subject only to the necessities of military operations all private property taken for military use should be paid or receded for pillage and waste should be treated as high crimes all unnecessary trespass sternly prohibited and offensive demeanor by the military towards citizens promptly rebuked military arrests should not be tolerated except in places where active hostilities exist and oaths not required by enactments constitutionally made should be neither demanded nor received military government should be confined to the preservation of public order and the protection of political rights 
military power should not be allowed to interfere with the relations of servitude either by supporting or impairing the authority of the master except for repressing disorder as in other cases slaves contraband under the act of congress seeking military protection should receive it the right of the government to appropriate permanently to its own service claims to slave labor should be asserted and the right of the owner to compensation therefore should be recognized this principle might be extended upon grounds of military necessity and security to all the slaves within a particular state thus working manumission in such state and in missouri perhaps in western virginia also and possibly even in maryland the expediency of such a military measure is only a question of time a system of policy thus constitutional and conservative and pervaded by the influences of christianity and freedom would receive the support of almost all truly loyal men would deeply impress the rebel masses in all foreign nations and it might be humbly hoped that it would commend itself to the favour of the almighty unless the principles governing the further conduct of our struggle shall be made known and approved the effort to obtain requisite forces will be almost hopeless a declaration of radical views especially upon slavery will rapidly disintegrate our present armies the policy of the government must be supported by concentrations of military power the national forces should not be dispersed in expeditions posts of occupation and numerous armies but should be mainly collected into masses and brought to bear upon the armies of the confederate states those armies thoroughly defeated the political structure which they support would soon cease to exist in carrying out any system of policy which you may form you will require a commander-in-chief of the army one who possesses your confidence understands your views and who is competent to execute your orders by directing the military forces of the nation to the accomplishment of the objects by you proposed i do not ask that place for myself i am willing to serve you in such position as you may assign me and i will do so as faithfully as ever subordinate served superior i may be on the brink of eternity and as i hope forgiveness from my maker i have written this letter with sincerity towards you and from love for my country very respectfully your obedient servant g b mcclellan major-general commanding his excellency abraham lincoln president this letter marks the beginning of general mcclellan's distinctively political career he had always been more or less in sympathy with the democratic party and consequently in an attitude of dormant opposition to the administration although after the manner of officers of the regular service he had taken no pronounced political attitude in fact on his first assuming command of the army of the potomac he had seemed to be in full sympathy with the president and cabinet in the proceedings they thought proper to adopt for the suppression of the rebellion he had even entered heartily into some of the more extreme measures of the government his orders to general banks directing the arrest of the secessionist members of the maryland legislature might have been written by a zealous republican when they meet on the seventeenth he says you will please have everything prepared to arrest the whole party and be sure that none escape he urges upon him the absolute necessity of secrecy and success speaks of the exceeding importance of the affair if it is successfully carried out it will go far towards breaking the backbone of the rebellion this was in september eighteen sixty one later in that year he was repeatedly urged by prominent democratic politicians to declare himself openly as a member of their party they thought it would be to his advantage and to theirs to have the general-in-chief of the army of the potomac decidedly with them at this time he declined their overtures but they were pressingly repeated at yorktown and afterwards and he appears finally to have yielded to their solicitations and the foregoing letter was the result it is not at all probable that this document was prepared during the flight from the chickahominy or during the first days of doubt and anxiety at harrison's landing it had probably been prepared long before and is doubtless referred to in the general's dispatch of the twentieth of june in which he says i would be glad to have permission to lay before your excellency by letter or telegraph my views as to the present state of military affairs throughout the whole country he had at that time some indefinite hope of taking richmond and such a manifesto as this coming from a general crowned with a great victory would have had a far different importance and influence from that which it enjoyed issuing from his refuge at harrison's bar after a discrediting retreat 
but the choice of occasion was not left to him the letter could not be delayed for ever and such as it was it went forth to the country as the political platform of general mcclellan and to the president as a note of defiance and opposition from the general in command of the principal army of the united states though more moderate in form this letter was as mutinous in substance as the dispatch from savage's station he assumes to instruct the president as to his duties and the limits of his constitutional power he takes it for granted that the president has no definite policy and proceeds to give him one unless his advice is followed our cause will be lost he postures as the protector of the people against threatened arbitrary outrage he warns the president against any forcible interference with slavery he lets him know he can have no more troops except on conditions known and approved he tells him plainly that a declaration of radical views especially upon slavery will rapidly disintegrate our present armies finally he directs him to appoint a commander-in-chief of the army and thinks it necessary to inform him that he does not ask the place for himself the president engrossed with more important affairs paid no attention then or afterwards to this letter he simply passed it by in good-natured silence general mcclellan continued his dispatches constantly announcing an impending attack upon his position and constantly asking for reinforcements he continued this until general lee withdrew his army to richmond a movement which general mcclellan at once characterized as a retreat during all the time mcclellan remained at harrison's landing his correspondence with the government was full of recrimination and querulousness and his private letters which have been published since his death show an almost indecent hostility to his superiors he writes i have no faith in the administration i am tired of serving fools marcy and i have just been discussing people in washington and conclude they are a mighty trifling set i begin to believe they wish this army to be destroyed when you contrast the policy i urge in my letter to the president with that of congress and of mr pope you can readily agree with me that there can be little natural confidence between the government and myself we are the antipodes of each other i am satisfied that the dolts in washington are bent on my destruction my communication with halleck was unsatisfactory in the extreme he did not even behave with common politeness he is a bien mauvais sujet he is not a gentleman we need not multiply these utterances they have already been judged by the highest authority general sherman says referring to this period the temper of his correspondence official and private was indicative of a spirit not consistent with the duty of the commanding general of a great army the president had been much disturbed by the conflicting reports that reached him as to the condition of the army of the potomac and he therefore resolved by a personal visit to satisfy himself of the state of affairs he reached harrison's landing on the eighth of july and while there conferred freely not only with general mcclellan himself but with many of the more prominent officers in command with the exception of general mcclellan not one believed the enemy was then threatening his position sumner thought they had retired much damaged keys that they had withdrawn to go towards washington porter that they dared not attack heitzelman and franklin thought they had retired franklin and keyes favored the withdrawal of the army from the james the rest opposed it mr lincoln came back bearing a still heavier weight of care one thing that gave him great trouble was the enormous number of absentees from the army on returning to washington he wrote this note to general mcclellan which like most of his notes it is impossible to abridge i am told that over one hundred and sixty thousand men have gone into your army on the peninsula when i was with you the other day we made out eighty six thousand five hundred remaining leaving seventy three thousand five hundred to be accounted for i believe twenty three thousand five hundred will cover all the killed wounded and missing in all your battles and skirmishes leaving fifty thousand who have left otherwise not more than five thousand of these have died leaving forty five thousand of your army still alive and not with it i believe half or two-thirds of them are fit for duty to-day have you any more perfect knowledge of this than i have if i am right and you had 
these men with you you could go into richmond in the next three days how can they be got to you and how can they be prevented from getting away in such numbers for the future to this note the general replied in a letter which can hardly be regarded as a satisfactory answer to the president's searching questions he says in general terms that there is always a difference between the returns and the effective force of armies he thinks but is not certain that the force given to him is not so much as one hundred and sixty thousand but admits that he has at that moment present for duty eighty eight thousand six hundred and sixty five absent by authority thirty four thousand four hundred and seventy two without authority three thousand seven hundred and seventy eight this is very far from the fifty thousand with their colours which he reported a few days before and he gives no adequate reason for the vast aggregate of those absent by authority but another question far more important and more grievous was what was to be done with the army of the potomac general mcclellan would listen to nothing but an enormous reinforcement of his army and another chance to take richmond many of his prominent officers on the contrary thought that an advance on richmond under existing conditions would be ill-advised and that for the army to remain in its present position during the months of august and september would be more disastrous than an unsuccessful battle the president had already placed general john pope at the head of the army of virginia in front of washington and he now took the resolution of sending to corinth for general halleck whom he placed in chief command of the armies of the united states this was done by an order of the eleventh of july and general halleck was requested to start at once for washington as soon as he could place his command in the hands of general grant the next officer in rank in his department he came on to washington assumed command of the army on the twenty third and the next day was sent to the camp of general mcclellan where he arrived on the twenty fifth he asked the general his wishes and views in regard to future operations mcclellan answered that he proposed to cross the james river and attack petersburg halleck stated his impression of the danger and impracticability of the plan to which mcclellan finally agreed the general-in-chief then told him that he regarded it as a military necessity to concentrate pope's army and his on some point where they could at the same time cover washington and operate against richmond unless it should be that mcclellan felt strong enough to take the latter place himself with such reinforcements as would be given him mcclellan thought he would require thirty thousand more than he had halleck told him that the president could only promise twenty thousand and that if mcclellan could not take richmond with that number some plan must be devised for withdrawing his troops from their present position to some point without exposing washington mcclellan thought there would be no serious difficulty in withdrawing his forces for that purpose but he feared the demoralizing influence of such a movement on his troops and preferred they should stay where they were until sufficient reinforcements could be sent him halleck had no authority to consider that proposition and told him that he must decide between advising the withdrawal of his forces to meet those of pope or an advance upon richmond with such forces as the president could give him halleck gained the impression that mcclellan's preference would be to withdraw and unite with general pope but after consultation with his officers he informed halleck the next morning that he would prefer to take richmond he would not say that he thought the probabilities of success were in his favor but that there was a chance and that he was willing to try it his officers were divided on the subject of withdrawing or making an attack upon richmond mcclellan's delusion as to the number of the enemy had infected many of the most intelligent generals in his command general keyes in a letter to quartermaster general meigs assured him that the enemy had two hundred thousand more than double our number at the same time general meigs himself simply from reading the richmond newspapers and controlling their accounts with his own common sense had formed an estimate of the rebel force very much nearer the truth than that made by the generals at the front he found it to consist of a hundred and fifty two regiments which at an average of seven hundred men too high an average would give a total force of one hundred and five thousand by general mcclellan's returns for the tenth of august he himself had an aggregate present of a hundred and thirteen thousand men 
halleck's return to washington was followed by a shower of telegrams from mcclellan urging the reinforcement of his army should it be determined to withdraw it he says on the thirtieth of july i shall look upon our cause as lost and the demoralization of the army certain a statement which certainly was lacking in reserve the weight of opinion however among the generals of highest rank was on the other side general keyes wrote in the strongest terms urging the withdrawal of the army general bernard mcclellan's chief of engineers and general franklin counselled the immediate withdrawal from the james to reunite with the forces covering the capital upon general halleck's return to washington this course was resolved upon general halleck's first order in that direction was dated the thirtieth of july requesting mcclellan to send away his sick as quickly as possible four days afterwards without having taken in the mean while any steps to obey the order mcclellan sent general hooker to malvern hill he drove away the confederates from there after a sharp cavalry skirmish this so brightened mcclellan's spirits that he telegraphed to halleck on the fifth that with reinforcements he could march his army to richmond in five days a suggestion to which halleck made the curt rejoinder i have no reinforcements to send you the order to dispose of the sick was not promptly obeyed because general mcclellan insisted upon knowing the intentions of the government in regard to his army and after being informed that it was to be withdrawn from the james several days more were wasted in wearisome interchange of dispatches between himself and halleck mcclellan protesting with the greatest energy and feeling against this movement and halleck replying with perfect logic and temper in defence of it in a long and elaborate dispatch in which halleck considered the whole subject he referred to the representation made to him by mcclellan and some of his officers that the enemy's forces around richmond amounted to two hundred thousand and that mcclellan had reported that they had since received large reinforcements general pope's army covering washington he adds is only about forty thousand your effective force is only about ninety thousand you are thirty miles from richmond and general pope eighty or ninety with the enemy directly between you ready to fall with his superior numbers upon one or the other as he may elect if general pope's army be diminished to reinforce you washington maryland and pennsylvania would be left uncovered and exposed if your force be reduced to strengthen pope you would be too weak to even hold the position you now occupy you say that the withdrawal from the present position will cause the certain demoralization of the army i cannot understand why unless the officers themselves assist in that demoralization which i am satisfied they will not but you will reply why not reinforce me here so that i can strike richmond from my present position to do this you said at our interview that you required thirty thousand additional troops you finally thought that you would have some chance of success with twenty thousand but you afterward telegraphed me that you would require thirty five thousand to keep your army in its present position until it could be so reinforced would almost destroy it in that climate in the meantime general pope's forces would be exposed to the heavy blows of the enemy without the slightest hope of assistance from you he tells mcclellan in conclusion that a large number of his highest officers are decidedly in favor of the movement weary at last of arguments halleck became more and more peremptory in his orders and this failing to infuse any activity into the movements of mcclellan he had recourse to sharp dispatches of censure which provoked only excuses and recriminations in some of his replies to halleck's urgent dispatches enjoining the greatest haste and representing the grave aspect of affairs in northern virginia mcclellan replied in terms that indicated as little respect for halleck as he had shown for the president and secretary of war on the sixth of august in answer to an order insisting on the immediate dispatch of a battery of artillery to burnside he calmly replies i will obey the order as soon as circumstances permit my artillery is none too numerous now on the twelfth little or no progress having yet been made he says there shall be no unnecessary delay but i cannot manufacture vessels it is not possible for any one to place this army where you wish it ready to move in less than a month if washington is in danger now this army can scarcely arrive in time to save it it is in much better position to do so from here than from aquia at the same time 
the quartermaster general reported that nearly every available steam vessel in the country was then under the control of general mcclellan only on the seventeenth of august was mcclellan able to telegraph that he had left his camp at harrison's bar and only on the twenty seventh of the month when pope's campaign had reached a critical and perilous stage did he report himself for orders at alexandria near washington end of chapter twenty four end of abraham lincoln a history volume five by john hay and john george nicolay